Episode 31. What is Shuculent? Megan realized that Kevin was a computer expert and could answer some of her questions. Kevin, can I ask you something? If a chat account was hacked, can it still be recovered? For Kevin, the subject was a piece of cake. Of course you can get it back. Really? Megan was surprised. I used to have an account which was hacked. Can you try and get it back for me? Sure. Give me your account ID. I'll help you recover it after I fix the computer. Megan wrote her account ID on a sticky note and handed it to Kevin. Kevin took the note and went into Olivia's study. Having an IT professional around really made a difference. Within half an hour, Kevin had not only repaired the desktop computer and installed the required live streaming equipment, but he had also recovered Megan's compromised chat account. He came out of the study and returned the sticky note to Megan. This is the new password I've set for the time being. After you log in, you can change it yourself. Okay, thank you so much, Kevin. You're welcome. Kevin chuckled as he rubbed the back of his head. Megan logged into her account with the new password. After modifying the password, she logged into the chat homepage. She found that the friends she had added before were still on the contact list, and there were red circles with numbers in them, signifying the unread messages that they had sent her. Most of them were messages from her patients and holiday greetings, but some were asking why Miss Johnson was not online anymore and where Miss Johnson had gone. Megan noticed that one of her patients, Wing, had sent her the most messages. Thousands of messages. Megan never would have thought that, after her account was hacked two years ago, Wing would continue leaving messages for her. But he had been reporting his progress and efforts to her every few days. Miss Johnson, this is the third week I'm doing rehabilitation. I am not as depressed as before. Now I have the courage to look up at the blue sky. Miss Johnson, I don't know why you didn't return my messages. Am I bothering you? Other than you, I don't have any friends who I can talk to. Can I continue to chat with you in the future? Miss Johnson, I went to the cinema today and saw a movie called The Stars on Earth. It is a story about a child with autism, and it was so touching. Every lonely soul will eventually find someone who understands him. Thank you for understanding me, too. Miss Johnson, I have been training for two hours today. Although it was very tiring, I feel that I've gained a lot and I feel great. I will not give up. Miss Johnson, today is my birthday. Miss Johnson, this is the second year of my rehabilitation. Although I have yet to stand up, I am now much better than before and can live independently. Megan spent a lot of time reading all the messages, but she only sent Wing one in reply. Sorry, Wing. My account was hacked two years ago and I just recovered it. I've seen all the messages you sent to me and I am very touched. Thank you for trusting and remembering me. I can feel your hard work and determination. It's been such a long time since we have talked. How are you now? After the message was sent out, the phone of Connor, who was far away at Talent X Entertainment, beeped as a message notification appeared on the home screen. He glanced at it. In disbelief, he put his work aside and picked up his phone to look at the message. A reply from Miss Johnson? After more than two years, he had finally gotten a reply. After reading the message, Connor finally understood. So that's why. So that's the reason why Miss Johnson never replied to me. Her ID was hacked. As he saw Miss Johnson's active status go from gray to green, Connor began to cheer deep in his heart. Finally! He was finally able to contact the person who had pulled him back from darkness, the person who had encouraged him and cared for him. Connor smiled as he quickly composed a reply message. Miss Johnson, thank God that you finally replied to my message. I'm actually doing quite well right now. I have my own business and hobbies now, and I finally found the girl I was looking for. My life is filled with excitement. I want to express my gratitude to you again for the encouragement and help that you've given me when I've needed it the most. Thank you. After a few moments, Miss Johnson replied, Congratulations! 
I will always pray for you. You'll definitely get better. Keep on fighting, Wing. Thank you. As soon as he put down his phone, Connor's heart fluttered. He was finally able to get in touch with Miss Johnson. It would definitely be better than going through all of this alone. He had finally found a friend who would accompany him through the journey. In that instance, Connor thought of meeting Miss Johnson face to face. He prayed to God to allow him to meet the one person who had been a mentor and a friend to him. Connor thought to himself, if one day I'm able to walk again, I'll definitely want to meet her. In Olivia's study room, Megan and Alice were preparing for their first live stream since they returned home. Alice wore a cherry red dress and a cherry hairpin. The hairpin was a gift from Olivia. The cute little girl sat in front of the camera, her beautiful dark eyes looking up and down. Fans started to join the live streaming. Pew, pew. A few hardcore fans began to send voice messages and gifts. Voice message. Cherry, oh Cherry, where have you been? I've missed you so much. Voice message. Where have you been, my little Cherry? It's so long. Message. Cherry, what are you going to perform today? Voice message. Oh, my cute little Cherry, will you sing this big sister a song? Voice message. Hi, Cherry. Were you serious when you said that you were returning to New York? Which place will you be living in? This auntie will bring some tasty treats when she visits you. From the moment the live streaming started, messages and gifts kept coming in. After listening to all of the voice messages, Alice turned off the voice function. She picked up the cartoon microphone and turned toward the audience. The cute little girl was a master of posing. She faced the camera and straightened herself up before greeting the audience. Hello, it's me, the little girl who's selling Shuckulent, Cherry Baby. I'm finally back to New York. I missed all of you too. Today I'm very thrilled to announce that we'll be having a two episode special edition live streaming to celebrate my return to New York. I'll be introducing all of you to a new friend in the next episode. Alice smiled for the audience as two cute dimples appeared on either side of her cheeks. With just a simple act, gifts started to pour in from the fans. Today I'll be recommending the succulent in my hand. The little girl still wasn't able to pronounce succulent correctly, but her way was so much cuter. She showed the combination of succulents in the pot and explained. This combination has a beautiful name. It's Alice and Succulent. <laughs> My mom was the one who thought of the name. She really is a genius and a babe. What? You guys want to meet her? Mummy. Episode 32, Megan Needs the Receipt. Cherry Baby hollered, and shortly after, a person in a pink rabbit costume came into view. After that, the auctioning widget appeared on screen too. The starting bid for Alice and Succuland was set at $20 with a $5 increment for each increasing bid. Rabbit Mommy waved at everyone, then turned to Cherry Baby. Hey, baby, why are you selling succulents every time you're on here? Cherry Baby, because Baby wants to make money. Rabbit Mommy, but you're still so young, what do you need the money for? Cherry Baby, Baby needs the money to help Mommy and also to buy a daddy. You said a daddy would be really expensive, so we need lots and lots of money to buy one. So Baby has to earn lots of money now and buy the bestest daddy in the world who will never leave us, ever. Cherry Baby took out a piggy bank as she explained, pouring the coins out and counting them. The way Cherry Baby counted her money was so adorable, but the words she had just said were incredibly moving. From her childish words, one could see that Cherry Baby had grown up in a single parent family living only with her mother. The little girl was naively optimistic and very eager to obtain the love of a father. 
Her speech was so moving that the price of the succulent plant skyrocketed with each bid. When the live stream ended five minutes later, Alice and Succuland was sold at $22.65. The price of similar succulent plants on other e-commerce sites were about $200. Cherry Baby's sale of the pot of succulents at the price of $2,265 was an impressive feat. Olivia, who was waiting beside them, watched the messages that kept appearing on the screen and all the gifts and rewards and the revenue rolling in from the auction. She was convinced that doing live streams was much better than selling flowers at her store. After Cherry Baby and Rabbit Mommy's live stream had ended, Olivia rushed over to them. Wow, I really see it now. Live streaming is so profitable. You guys are amazing. Megan took off the rabbit suit and said to Olivia, Go change into a costume. You can try an episode with Alice later. Okay, okay. Olivia ran off to change into her specially prepared suit. The second live stream began. The cute little baby showed her face, flashing a row of beautiful white little teeth as she smiled. Hello everyone. I am the sucky selling girl, Cherry Baby. Before Baby introduces a new friend, I would like to promote a beautiful pot of suckies. Look at my hands. Alice held up a pot of succulents. Its name is the Succulent Knights. Isn't it very cute? Okay, next I'm going to introduce Olivia. After showing off the succulent plant, the auctioning widget appeared and the bidding started again. Alice then invited Olivia to appear. Olivia was nervous as it was her first live stream debut and her palms were sweating. Fortunately, she had worn a large olive-shaped costume over her head so no one could see who she was. This is my auntie Olivia. She is a very good person and I like her very much. They had discussed beforehand that Olivia was to be introduced as Alice's aunt. Alice turned to look at Olivia. Olivia froze for a few seconds before she reacted. It was her turn to talk to everyone. After Alice had finished introducing Olivia, the comments section was filled with questions about Cherry's mom. They were all wondering whether Cherry's mom was going to appear in live streams anymore. Hello everyone, I'm Cherry Baby's aunt, Olivia. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to meet all of you. Cherry's mom will be very busy from now on, so I'll be helping out with Cherry's live streaming for a while. I think we'll get along well. Thank you. Olivia was very nervous as she spoke to the audience and her voice was a little shaky. Luckily, she didn't make any mistakes. The live stream continued according to the script and the two partnered up quite well. Olivia began to relax in the midst of the process and started to focus. Because Cherry had prepared two special episodes for her return to New York, the number of fans had risen dramatically. More and more fans started to flood their live streaming. Connor sat in his office in the Talent X Entertainment building. He was one of the fans watching the live stream. What surprised him was that Cherry Baby had prepared a two episode special edition stream. Connor had been watching live streams for a few months and he'd begun to grasp the fundamentals. When he saw other fans sending gifts to the cute little girl, he could not control his urge to send her gifts as well. Suddenly, the streaming page changed into celebratory settings. The system messages showed that a user, Amancio Adelson, had sent them a crystal carriage that was worth $10,000. Olivia's eyes were wide as she stared at the screen. Holy shit! Some billionaire just sent us a ton of money. If they split the 10,000, each of them could get 5,000 each. Oh my God. So this is why people work as streamers. The auction ended with Amancio Adelson bidding $50, $60 for the succulent night. After the stream ended, Olivia realized that she had learned a lot from it. 
she finally gave in to the idea of being a live streamer and decided to follow Alice for the rest of her life. They could live stream together and get very rich. Since Olivia had finally settled her financial problem with live streaming, she began to worry about Megan. I thought you've always hated the showbiz. What made you decide on becoming an actress? After seeing Megan's stunt performance earlier that day, she wondered if Megan was in her right mind. Wouldn't it be great if you could just continue doing live streaming with your daughter? Why would you choose the harder path? But this was not the first time Megan had acted. She had taken various acting jobs when she was still in New York. Of course, most of them were minor characters or doubles, far from real acting. A smile appeared on Megan's face as she told Olivia the truth. It's true that I hate the showbiz. That field is filled with trash. Everyone uses each other. Lies are everywhere. It's a place where only the strong have a hope at survival. Sometimes I think the place is like hell itself, trapping thousands of souls with ease. I entered the showbiz not only because I love acting, but because I want to purge the devils lurking inside the industry. I, I really want to fulfill my mother's dying wishes. I want the people who hurt my mother to pay. Megan's eyes were filled with an embattled dedication as she continued to speak. Olivia looked at Megan quietly. Five years. The Megan she once knew had changed entirely. She had become more confident, braver, stronger. It was truly touching. Of course, Olivia would support Megan all the way. What worried her was Alice. Megan, no matter what you do, I'll always stay by your side. But have you ever considered what will happen to Alice when you become famous? Megan was silent for a moment, then she sighed. I'm also troubled by this, but Alice is my daughter and no matter what the circumstances, I have a responsibility to protect her from harm. Having said that, she considered the paparazzi of the entertainment circle. How well she knew that they were insatiable. How could she possibly keep them from finding out about Alice? Olivia had come up with an idea. Megan, I think I actually might have a way to solve this problem regarding Alice. Go on. Just tell them that Alice is your niece. When you're busy filming, you can put Alice at my place. I'm not that busy with my flower shop business anyway, she admitted. Oh, Olivia, that's a great idea. You've thought it all out. How considerate of you. If you were a man, I would marry you in a heartbeat. Megan was so moved that she gave Olivia a hug. She was such a kind and caring friend. She was glad to have a friend as loyal as Olivia in her life. Olivia smiled and patted her back, laughing. I would marry you too, but I'm afraid Kevin wouldn't approve. Alice had overheard the conversation of the two adults. She understood her mother's difficulties and wanted to prove that she was not a burden to her mother. She said to Olivia, Auntie Olivia, baby is trying to make money every day. Lots and lots of money so I can buy a big beautiful house for mom and beautiful clothes for mom and a caring and handsome husband for mom. What's a husband? asked Olivia. Isn't mom's husband my daddy? Oh, Auntie Olivia, how could you not figure that out? Maybe you're not so bright after all. Alice shook her head. Uh, I was just patronized by a four-year-old kid. Alice continued to fantasize about her dream future. I also want to buy a big castle for mom so she can become a princess. And baby wants to make mom the happiest mommy in the world. Happiest. Ugh, Olivia had no idea what to say. Is that easy for a single mother to get happiness? It was not that Olivia was being unsympathetic. Realistically speaking, it wouldn't be easy for Megan to find another man to marry, as long as she had a child to take care of. Who would want to be a stepfather? But Megan had never seen Alice as a burden, and she loved her. If her daughter hadn't come into her life, how much happiness would she have missed out on for all these years? 
Besides, Alice was more mature than the other children of her age. Alice would never let her worry and whenever she went, she would still feel the warmth of the little one. With Olivia's help in caring for Alice, Megan could relax a little, relieved to have the support. The next morning, Megan decided to go redeem her mother's violin from the pawn shop. Five years ago, in order to raise money for her studies to California, Megan had pawned her mother's violin for $100,000. She had planned to redeem it after returning from California, and today was the deadline for the loan. It was an heirloom left behind by her mother, and she knew she had to redeem it. She opened her suitcase and looked for the pawn receipt, but she couldn't find it anywhere. She tried to remember where she had left it. Oh no, the receipt was in the pocket of the clothes I wore that day. Connor changed my clothes. I wonder if he disposed of them. It was a serious matter, and Megan called Connor at once. Episode 33, Trouble on the Way. It was break time at Talent X Entertainment. A vintage phonograph sat atop a cupboard in the CEO's office, filling the space with piano music. Connor would only listen to music when he was in a good mood. The phonograph had been collecting dust for years, and it finally got to play some beautiful music again. Music was one of Connor's hobbies, and he was very talented. He could play various orchestra instruments. If he had pursued a music career from the start, he might have become a famous musician by now. He was also proficient in writing lyrics and composing music. He had written and produced the ending theme for the movie that got him the award for International Best Actor, 24 Hours of Life. As Connor sat immersing himself in the music, he got a call from Megan. He was both shocked and surprised by the call. He quickly turned off the music. Talent X Entertainment, how may I help you? Connor, oh, my apologies. Uh, Mr. Wilson, I have something to ask you. Did you keep the dirty clothes that you helped me change out of the day before yesterday? Uh, yes, I just had them washed. Connor could hear Megan panting on the other side of the phone. Why? What's the matter? It's still there. Megan was relieved. Was there any paper in the pocket when you washed it? Connor thought about it. There was, but it was destroyed by the washing machine. Connor was not used to checking the pockets before washing his clothes. He would always soak the clothes in water and detergent before throwing them into the machine. He only noticed that there was a piece of paper in the pocket after the clothes came out. By then, the paper had turned to pulp. It was impossible to read what was on it anymore. Oh. As soon as Megan heard Connor's reply, everything went black. It was like she was struck by lightning. She felt like dying on the spot. Was it important? Connor asked. If the receipt from the pawn shop is gone, how am I supposed to reclaim my mother's violin? Oh, God. Are you trying to kill me? Hello? Megan? Is that paper important? No, it's not important. I'm fine. Goodbye. After Megan hung up, she felt like crying. Who could she blame? Connor helped her wash her clothes out of kindness. There was no way she could blame him. All she could do was blame her luck. Even though she had lost the receipt, Megan did not give up. She still wanted to go to the pawn shop and ask whether she could get her violin back without the receipt. Megan went to New York Pawn Shop where she talked to the manager at the front desk, but he told her there was nothing to be done. We're sorry, ma'am. This is the rule of our pawn shop. We can't give you a free pass. Please understand. We won't be able to let you reclaim the violin unless you have the receipt. Maybe you could go back and look harder? Megan left the pawn shop in such low spirits. The thought of ending her life even crossed her mind. I should have come and reclaimed the violin on the very first day I came back. Today is the last day for me to reclaim it, and now the receipt is gone. What am I supposed to do? 
Megan went home in agony. The next morning, she went to the pawn shop in New York again and pleaded with the front manager. I didn't lose my receipt. It was destroyed in the washing machine. Can you please cut me some slack? I've already brought $100,000 and five years of interest to repay the loan. I beg you, please return my violin to me. No matter how much she begged, the front manager wouldn't budge. I'm sorry, madam. You didn't show up with the receipt in time, and the item has been processed for the overdue loan. It has entered the auctioning circulation. I really can't do more to help you. I'm truly sorry. The front manager had said all he could say. Megan had to give up. She inquired about the auction and learned that her mother's violin would be auctioned at the New York Relic Auction House at noon that day. Megan panicked. Oh no, if the violin was sold off, she might not have the chance to find it again. Megan rushed off to the bank and spent the whole morning at the counter withdrawing all the money from her fixed deposits that she had made when she was at California. She also withdrew all the money she had earned from doing live streams with Alice and put them all onto one card. With $100,000 in her bag, plus the amount on her card, she had more than $600,000. Megan had a bit of hope. Five years ago, the violin was pawned for $100,000. Now, she had six times as much. It should certainly be possible for her to get the violin back. Finally, it was noon. There was no time for lunch, and Megan rushed off with her bag to Relic Auction House, New York's largest. As she hurried through the doors of the building, she accidentally bumped into a proud and elegant-looking woman with long hair fanning over her shoulders. When Megan had returned from California, she didn't know about the young violin diva, Diana Walton, who had just gotten famous locally. Diana Walton wore heels 10 centimeters high in beige Chanel-style dress. She had kept an elegant posture, but was knocked a little off balance by Megan. Just as the accident was happening, a janitor passed by with a garbage trolley. Diana Walton staggered and fell onto the garbage trolley, staining her dress. Hey, watch where you're going, Diana Walton shrieked. She picked herself up and stared at her skirt, frowning. Look how dirty my clothes are. Don't you know how expensive this dress is? Megan quickly apologized. I'm so, so sorry. I was moving too quickly and I didn't see you. I'm really sorry. If your clothes are dirty, let me send it for dry cleaning for you. Megan had already apologized and was willing to help dry clean her clothes, but Diana Walton was arrogant and seemed committed to being unreasonable. Do you even have time to go to the laundry shop now? What am I supposed to wear? Are you blind? Where is your brain? Seeing that the woman was being difficult, Megan began to lose her patience. Miss, it was unintentional. I already apologize and I'm willing to help you dry clean your clothes. What else do you want? Diana Walton crossed her arms and raised an eyebrow. It was clear as day that she was going to stay angry. What if the dry cleaning ruins it, huh? Do you really think that I can't afford the dry cleaning fee? This is a limited edition shirt and you'll just have to buy me a new one. The verbal fight escalated and a crowd began to gather around them. How much can your shirt possibly be worth? $100,000. Can you even afford it? Someone as plain as you could never earn the money to buy this kind of shirt. Diana Walton looked down at Megan and her plain clothes. Yet Megan was not as pathetic as Diana Walton made her out to be. She had been working for hours without rest. Her hair was messy and she didn't have time to change her clothes. It's true, her appearance wasn't one which people would expect to see in the Relic Auction House. To settle the trouble with Diana Walton, Megan opened her handbag and threw it next to Diana Walton's leg. Only 100000 Then I'll buy all of your clothes. The handbag fell onto the floor and a few bundles of cash rolled from the bag. One look was enough to know that there was more than $100,000 in that handbag. 
Diana Walton was stunned by the massive amount of money. She never thought that someone like Megan would carry such a fortune with her. She was embarrassed in front of everyone and had nowhere to run. Megan was not someone who would submit to such a bully. She stood in the middle of the crowd and smiled. I believe everyone has heard this lady say that her clothes cost more than 100000 and that I won't be able to afford it. I have the money with me now, so I believe everything she's wearing belongs to me. Am I right? The crowd that had been watching the fight all agreed. Yes, of course you're right. You're willing to spend the 100000 Naturally, the clothes belong to you now. Megan stared at the lady standing before her. I believe you've heard what people said. I've already paid for the clothes. Please remove all your clothes for me. Right this instance. The crowd began chanting, Strip, strip, strip. You, you, you won't get away with this. Diana Walton was furious at how she was being pressured by Megan. Of course, she wouldn't strip in front of the crowd. At that moment, a well-dressed, wealthy businessman walked towards Diana Walton and asked, Diana, what's wrong? As soon as Diana Walton saw that it was her dad, she began to wail. Daddy! She started crying, telling him everything that had just happened. Her father, Gerald Walton, listened to her story, but to him, it was not that big of a matter. He understood her daughter's temper, that she had always liked being the center of attention. He didn't make any further comments on the situation and told the crowd that it was a simple misunderstanding. Then he took off with his daughter. All right, Diana, stop crying, okay? I'll buy you new clothes later. Come on, didn't you say that you wanted to get a specific violin? Let's go get it for you, shall we? Gerald Walton continued to comfort his daughter as they walked into the auction house. After the Waltons have left, the crowd started to gossip. Hey, wasn't that Diana Walton, the violin diva who just rose to fame? Now that you mention it, you might be right. I was wondering where I'd seen her before. Oh man, she's so much prettier in person. But I will say, she really has a bad temper. Tell me about it. So many rich kids these days being spoiled by their parents. I've heard her perform live once. She definitely has the skill. I think she's going to perform live at New York Art Gallery next month. Megan stood listening to the crowd's conversation. Episode 34, Precious Belonging. By listening to the murmurings of the crowd, Megan learned the identity of the woman who she just squabbled with. She was the New York-born violin diva Diana Walton. If Megan remembered correctly, Diana Walton's father was Jared Walton, the biggest industrialist in the country. It was no wonder he had the power to put his daughter onto the world stage. Jared Walton had also just mentioned something about Diana Walton wanting a violin. Could it be that she was eyeing Megan's mother's violin? Her heart began to beat incredibly fast. She picked up her money and her bag from the floor and ran to the auction registration office. After registering and getting a bidder number, Megan entered the auction hall. She looked for a seat and sat down. Finally, the auction started. Pictures and information for each of the five musical instruments were displayed on the big screen. Megan recognized the violin named Artemis, the one that her mother had used, the one named after her mother. Her mother's name was Christine, but Artemis was another name. When Megan saw the violin, an image of her mother playing it flashed in her mind. Megan was both anxious and excited. She silently prayed that she would be able to get the violin back. The auctioneer appeared, and the auction began. Megan did not care for the first four lots. She was waiting for the fifth one to appear. She was waiting for Artemis. On stage, the staff placed the fifth auction lot on a stand. The violin was visibly aged and rusted inside a glass case. 
the white-gloved auctioneer began to introduce the instrument to the crowd of collectors. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have here now is a violin. It has a lovely name, Artemis, named after the moon god of Greek mythology. It was created by the world-renowned Italian luthier Antonia Stradivari and was owned by the world-class violinist Artemis. This violin is well preserved and has a beautiful sound. The starting price is 50000 You may start bidding. Megan's placard was the first in the air. The auctioneer gestured at her. Okay, first bid goes to number seven. More bids followed. Placards rose into the air one after another and the price of her mother's violin soared. It quickly rose to $200,000. Please don't rise anymore. Please don't rise anymore. Please don't rise anymore. Megan prayed silently, but it seemed the crowd was in a bidding frenzy and wouldn't stop raising their placards into the air. Many people thought the violin was worth collecting. It was not only because it was the work of Antonia Stradivari, but it was also because Artemis had owned it previously. Artemis was a former world-class violinist as well as a superstar in the entertainment industry. Although she had not managed to win the title of Best Actress, she was considered an uncrowned queen in the hearts of the people. Due to the immeasurable value of the violin, many fought to bid for it. By the second round, its price had risen to $800,000. $800,000? Megan stared as the auctioneer announced the price. Oh my god, $800,000? The money in her bag and her bank card was hardly enough. Can't get it back anymore. A feeling of despair grew within her. Megan felt terrible and hated herself. She felt stupid for not knowing how valuable her mother's violin would be. And five years ago, she had pawned it for a mere $100,000. Megan felt stupid, falling into despair as people continued to bid for the violin. She was all worn out, scarcely having the energy to breathe. In the end, the one who won the bid with three billion was none other than Gerald Walton. It was a gift for his daughter, Diana Walton. The violin now belonged to Diana Walton, who glowed, kissing her father on the cheek. All Megan could do was stare at the Waltons. They paid three billion for the violin, and there was nothing that she could do to make them hand it over. After the auction had ended, Megan dragged herself out of the relic auction house with a heavy heart. Even breathing was hard for her at the moment. She tried to wipe off her tears, yet they wouldn't stop. I'm sorry, Mom. I lost your favorite violin. I'm so sorry. She wondered how long it would take for her to earn $3 billion. She wiped her tears and swore to God that she would work harder, as hard as she could, to earn more money. Suddenly, her phone rang. Stage manager Williams was calling to ask if she was free later that evening, as there were a few scenes for which they could use her as a double. Yeah, I've got nothing to do later, Mr. Williams. I'll be there. This was evidence that the production team was satisfied with Megan's performance, since they wanted her to play a double again. She instantly accepted the job and rushed to the eastern suburb of New York. Megan hurried to do the shooting scene for The Root of Evil and met up with Mr. Williams. After getting all the information, she went to change her clothes. Then she went to work with her performance. In the first scene, the heroine would be chasing the second male lead through the forest. The scene included a high-risk fight with the second male lead, Chris Ryan, so the lead actress didn't want to play the scene herself. So the crew called in a double. They started shooting, and Megan began to pursue Chris Ryan until they reached the forest where the fight began. Because the director wanted the scene to feel as real as possible, light punches or flops would not be enough. The forest scene itself was shot more than four times, with Megan receiving many punches and Chris falling more than ten times. Chris wasn't able to control the force of his punches since he wasn't used to hitting a girl. Can you stand? asked Chris. He felt embarrassed for hitting a girl so much and outstretched his hand, offering Megan his assistance. I'm fine, thanks. 
Megan gritted her teeth and stood up. She adjusted her pace and turned to face Chris. Again. Chris was impressed by Megan's passion and discipline as a stunt double. As soon as they heard the whistle, they began to fight each other again. The whole evening was filled with screams and punches as they sprinted and rolled on the ground. When they'd finished shooting, Megan stayed and ate the fast food that had been prepared by the staff. After finishing his food, Chris went and looked for Megan. He sat down right beside her. Megan was actually a bit flustered by his approach. Chris was a rising star with a massive fan base. He was on the verge of becoming a huge star, and yet he seemed friendly and caring. What are you playing on your phone? Chris peeked at Megan's screen and noticed that she was playing the Royal Alliance. Wow, he exclaimed. I would never have pegged you as someone who'd like this type of game. Well, I only play it when I'm bored, Megan smiled. Come on then, let's team up, said Chris, pulling out his phone and booting up the game. As soon as Chris added Megan to his friend list, his jaw almost dropped to the ground. You've got to be kidding me. You're the number three player on the whole server? You mean your hustle night? Chris would have never imagined that the masculine sounding username, Hustle Knight, belonged to Megan. I'm not really a pro. I've been using this account to try to show off, but I am actually kind of a noob. Megan was telling the truth, but Chris was already treating her like she was his idol. Come on, let's team up. Carry me, please. Megan invited Last Terminator to join the faction created by her senior. They happily spent the next hour playing the game. They were both passionate about the game and quickly became good friends. When the game was over, Chris was still eager for more. It's great to team up with the pro. Megan Johnson, let's play together again sometime. All right, Megan promised cheerfully. After that, Megan resumed filming the remaining stunt scenes. When she was done, it was already 10 p.m. Megan went to Mr. Williams and received $2,000 for the day's work. She then left the set, feeling very exhausted. The set was pretty far from the nearest bus station. She had come in a taxi, but now that she had to leave, she had to walk to the station. The road was dark, and the two lonely street lamps along the road weren't enough to keep the darkness at bay. Upon completing her first stunt double gig when she'd returned from California, she had heard from Olivia that there had been several murder cases in the eastern suburbs. Most of the victims had been young women, including up-and-coming actresses. They had all been robbed, raped, and murdered. The night wind blew. Megan wrapped her arms around herself, just thinking about the terrible news that Olivia had told her sent a chill down her spine. As she followed the puddles of light on the ground, she imagined that the swaying tree shadows were vicious stalkers, and this freaked her out. She tightened her clutch on her handbag and broke into a terrified run. When she turned the corner, two men jumped out in front of her. They stood in the middle of the road, blocking her way. Megan's heart leapt into her throat. Oh God, I jinxed myself. Please don't tell me these men are robbers. Their faces were half covered by masks, only their eyes were visible. They were armed with long knives and looked like professionals. Megan gulped. Don't panic. Remember Uncle Richard, the leader of the first squadron of the famous J.S. Mercenary Group? In the past few years, when she had been living in New York, Megan had spent a lot of time with the Mercenary Group and picked up some combat skills from her Uncle Richard. She was a professional stunt double and could beat up these lowly thugs any day. Hand over the money, one of the men waved the knife in his hand. I don't have money, Megan said. The robber did not believe her. Are you taking us for fools? You have $100,000 in your bag. Um, Megan was puzzled. How did they know that she had more than $100,000 in her bag? What Megan did not know was she had been targeted at the Relic Auction House when she had thrown her bag to the floor and spilled the money. The two men had followed her to the eastern suburbs. They were after the cash in her bag and had spent the last seven or eight hours waiting for her. Throw the bag over and we'll let you live, or else. The two men waved their knives threateningly as they moved towards her. 
Also, you want the money? Here you go. Megan pretended to throw the bag. As the men reached out to catch it, Megan sent one of the thugs flying with a vicious kick. Hmm, let's see if you're worthy of the money. Her bag swung in an arc before returning into her arms. When the two men realized her deception, they raised their knives and lunged at her. Episode 35, Someone Makes Me Feel Warm. Megan moved swiftly, completing a few somersaults and throwing a few punches. Both of the assailants were beaten nearly to a pulp. The two tried to relaunch their attack. This time, Megan caught one of them head on, grabbing his head. As she was preparing to hit two of the assailants heads together, a car stopped abruptly in front of them. Megan raised her head and noticed that it was Connor's car. In just the span of a few seconds, James came out from the car with a few hired muscles, charging both of the assailants. Connor followed them out of the car in his wheelchair. As soon as Megan saw that it was her Prince Charming emerging from the car, she became anxious. She didn't want Connor to see her masculine side. She quickly threw both of her assailants on the floor and sat down crying. She was trying to act weak and frail in front of Connor. Along with the bodyguards, James quickly apprehended the two assailants. Connor maneuvered his electronic wheelchair toward Megan. He looked at her, worried. Megan, are you hurt? If he hadn't asked James to drive him to the eastern suburb to settle some business, Connor would have never learned that Megan was working as a stunt double for The Root of Evil. He was worried for her, and it was almost midnight, and he wanted to take her home. Megan asked Connor with tears in her eyes. She ran over to him and hugged his legs. Mr. Wilson, thank God. I thought I would have been in such trouble if it wasn't for you. The two unlucky assailants heard her wailing to Connor and twitched their lips. Seriously, girl, can't you be a little more honest? If it weren't for these people appearing at the right time, both of us could be in a hospital by now. Connor looked at this poor lady and started to worry. He offered Megan his hand and pulled her up. Wipe your tears. Come on, let's get into the car. He handed her his handkerchief. Megan stopped crying as soon as they stepped into the car. She pulled her sleeves intentionally to hide the bruises from the chute. Connor noticed that Megan was covered in dust and handed her a hot towel. Here, you can wipe yourself with this. Oh, thank you. As Megan stretched her hand to take the towel from Connor, her sleeve rolled up a little, exposing the bruises on her arm. Connor noticed them and his face darkened. He quickly grabbed her hand and rolled her sleeve all the way up to check her injuries. Her arm is covered in bruises. What about the other arm? Are there any bruises in other areas as well? Connor tightened his expression. Did those people who assaulted you cause these? No, not at all. Megan smiled, withdrawing her hand, acting all strong and sturdy. Connor began thinking that she sustained the injuries when she was substituting as a stunt double. He had studied The Root of Evil beforehand and understood that it was a gangster movie filled with all sorts of fighting scenes. What blew Connor's mind was why a fragile girl like Megan would want to act as a stunt double. Megan? A stunt double? Really? With your acting potential, you could become a mainstream actress. When Megan raised her head and looked at Connor, his eyes were filled with coldness and a touch of anger could be heard in his voice. Connor was actually worried about her. With her potential and some guidance, she could definitely become a huge star. Megan cleaned her face and smiled at Connor. Thank you for your confidence in me, Mr. Wilson, but I'm fine. I've been working as a stunt double for a while now. These types of injuries are normal for me. They'll heal in a few days. Jeez, this lady. Even if she's not worried about getting hurt, I'm worried for her. Connor didn't want to see Megan being hurt whatsoever. If she were ever injured, he would feel bad. 
Connor's gaze fell onto Megan's bag. There were bundles of cash under the half-open zipper. What were you thinking? Don't you know that the eastern suburbs aren't safe? A girl carrying a pack of cash alone at night? Are you looking for trouble? He seemed to imply that she was stupid, that nobody was more foolish than her. Megan couldn't explain why she was running around with so much cash. She forced a smile. Oh, I was going to deposit the money, but I haven't found a bank yet. Connor felt uneasy and sighed. Megan, do you know if you got injured? I... He couldn't finish his sentence. He blamed himself for not knowing her plans earlier. I can only blame myself for not being able to protect her. So what if I were injured? What would you do? Megan looked at Connor curiously. Although she had sensed that he was blaming himself, he was actually concerned and worried too. Him? Worried about me? Is he angry because I was injured during the stunt double job? <laughs> what an adorable man. He even looks cute while angry. Her eyes were clear with innocence as she gazed at him. Connor flushed in embarrassment. He deliberately put on a casual tone. If you were injured, wouldn't I be in trouble too? He asked. No one could take care of me. I would have to take care for you. You're really a troublemaker, you know. <laughs> After listening to his sloppy explanation, Megan laughed, her voice bright as a silver bell. She did not know why, but ever since Connor appeared in her life, she had begun to feel more valued. His words had warmed her heart and made her feel cared for. All the sorrows and weariness of the day instantly disappeared, gone with the wind. It seems that all isn't lost. If the violin was sold, then she would just have to think of a way to buy it back. Connor didn't want her to be a stunt double. That wouldn't be a problem as she was going to become a risk-free supporting actor soon. Connor did not send Megan home. Instead, he ordered his driver to drive them back to his residence at Brooklyn Heights Apartments. He had already prepared new clothes for Megan, including new underwear and pajamas. They were all washed and dried and kept at his home, just in case she needed them. Now was the time to put them to good use. After taking a shower, Megan put on a soft cotton cartoon pajamas and went into the living room. She saw Connor and spoke. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. This was very considerate of you. Of course I have to be considerate. I must be considerate with her. She is mine, after all. Connor glanced at Megan, who had just emerged from the shower. Her cheeks were red, and her skin was radiant and supple. She had twisted her hair into a bun that sat on top of her head. She looked like a cute little rabbit in those cartoon pajamas. When she came over to the sofa and sat, he pointed to the glass of milk on the table. Have some more milk. Thanks. Megan took the milk and drank it. Connor suddenly spoke. Aren't you worried that I might have spiked the milk? Megan almost spat out her mouthful of milk, but she drank it before answering calmly. Nope, I don't think you're that kind of person. At this point, she trusted Connor completely. Connor was in a wheelchair and his disability led to some sexual dysfunction. He would never do anything to her. And though he was both an award-winning actor and CEO, he didn't act like it. His concern was more like that of a worried friend, like how Olivia would worry about her. Megan could only feel secure and comfortable when staying with a sincere guy like Connor. When she said that Connor was not the kind of guy who would drug her, he felt happy. This meant that Megan was finally starting to trust him. Connor felt incredibly pleased. Of course I'm not, but you still have to be careful when you're outside with other people, he added. Fine, fine, I will, Megan nodded. Connor brought out a medical kit as Megan finished her milk. He took out medicine for bruises and wheeled himself to Megan's side. Come, here's some medicine. Give me your arm. It's fine, I'll do it myself. Applying medicine meant having some skin contact. Other than that, she wouldn't dare let her Prince Charming do it himself. What are you afraid of? Connor raised his head and looked at her with his cool, dark eyes. It was like he was silently questioning her. Why are you still afraid of me? 
No, it's just, Megan stammered. Without giving her any time to decline, Connor grabbed her arm and started to apply the medicine. Megan stared at Connor as he went about his work. An unexplainable affection began to rise in her heart. For all those years, no one had actually cared about her except for Alice and her uncles. And now the guy she had sex with once, five years ago, was treating her with unconditional care and love. Oh, how am I supposed to repay him for his kindness? After Connor had applied the medicine for Megan, he took her wallet and counted the money inside. There's 132000 in here. Leave the cash with me. I'll transfer the money to your bank from my phone. Sure thing. Thanks a lot. Connor didn't reply, but deep down in his heart, he thought, don't worry about it. For you, I'm willing to do anything. Megan took out her bank card and showed Connor her account name and account number. As soon as Connor noticed that the name on the card was Megan Johnson, he couldn't control his curiosity. Megan Johnson, he asked. Did you change your name? Yep, that's my stage name, she explained. You should call me by this name from now on. I quite like the sound of it. The reason for her to adopt a stage name was not that it sounded good, but because she didn't want to have anything to do with the Lee family. Connor's lips formed a smile, his charming eyes shining brightly. Megan Johnson. Megan Johnson. It really does have a nice sound. After he had made the transaction, Connor asked, Have you signed a contract with any company yet? Do you have a manager? Awkward. I'm not even a real actress yet. Who would want a contract with me? All of the stunt double acts that Megan had worked on were introduced to her through the black market. Nope. No company. No manager. Megan smiled awkwardly. Then, do you want to join Talent X? Connor stared at Megan, his expression telling her that all she has to do was ask. No, no thanks. I don't really want to. I think it's best if I don't. The truth was, there would be a lot of issues with joining Telenex, and she didn't want to fall into dealing with all of them just yet. Michael currently had a full-time contract as a director with Talentex Entertainment. If she joined Talentex, Michael would make her life incredibly difficult. Then how about Renaissance Entertainment? Connor was in charge of Talentex Entertainment, but he also owned half the shares of Renaissance Entertainment. He had recommended these two companies because he wanted to sign her under his own name and manage everything for her. Connor believed in giving the person he loved the best life possible. Megan quickly shook her head. No thank you for your kind offer. For the time being, I don't want to enter Talent X or Renaissance. Why? Connor was puzzled. There were many actors who were trying everything they could to enter Talent X or Renaissance, and they still didn't have a chance. And yet, she didn't want this rare opportunity. The fact was, Megan's father was a film director working under Talent X, her sister a star actress with Renaissance, and her brother-in-law, George, the president of Renaissance. So no matter how he looked at it, if Megan wanted to enter the entertainment circle, either Talent X or Renaissance should be her first choice. But Connor didn't understand Megan's situation with her family. He had paid special attention to the Lee family and other people like George because he cared for Megan. If she were to let him know that his good intentions had been inconveniencing her instead of helping her, he probably would have burst a blood vessel. I know that Talent X and Renaissance are good, but I don't want to depend on my family's connections. I want to climb the ladder with my own efforts and achieve my goals by myself. Thank you for your kindness. For the time being, Megan had no way of explaining her family situation with regards to Renaissance to Connor. She could only politely decline his kindness. Connor was surprised that she was so ambitious. It was clear that she possessed a lot of easily accessible resources, and yet she chose to find another way. She was really a special woman, and he had been right about her. Since she didn't want to join Talent X or Renaissance, Connor had another plan to keep her. I know of another company. It's an alternative and independent company in the entertainment industry. 
although they're not famous, the company is well connected. They're gaining traction within the industry. If you are interested, I can introduce you to them. Is it owned by one of your friends too? Megan asked suspiciously. Connor had grown familiar with her temper. He knew that she didn't want to have anything to do with his overbearing support. Well, the truth is, he is my friend, but he's also my competitor. Megan became interested when she heard that it was an independent and alternative company run by Connor's competitor. What company is it? Euphoria Entertainment. She hadn't heard of it, so it was really a new company. Somehow Megan felt a connection to it. Sounds good. Where are they located? When are you free? I'll take you there. Megan thought about her schedule. Only tomorrow was free. How about tomorrow? Do you have time then? Yes, I should have some time. For Megan, you would always make time. That settles it then. Megan stood up, tugging on the hem of her pajamas. I should go back. Could you get the driver to send me home? Connor raised his wrist and looked at his watch. It was nearly midnight. It's already 12 o'clock. If you go back now, you'll have to trouble your friend to open the door for you. Why don't you call her up and tell her you're not coming back? I have a lot of rooms, and you can stay here for the time being. When morning comes, we can go to Euphoria Entertainment together. What a persuasive argument to get her to stay. Episode 36, Rushing Somewhere. That was a smart way to make her stay. Megan couldn't find any reason not to stay. She scratched her head. All right, I'll be heading up then. The guest room is the second one on your left, said Connor. You can sleep there. Thank you. Megan went up a few steps and stopped. Mr. Wilson, do you need any of my assistance? Like, she turned toward Connor. She was treated so well by him and had almost forgotten that she was still his personal assistant. No thanks. I'll call for you if I need anything. Okay then. Good night. Megan smiled at him. Seeing her smile made Connor smile too, revealing a pair of charming dimples. Stunned by these attractive dimples, Megan felt her face flush. She turned, hurrying to the guest room. As soon as Megan had gone, Connor wheeled his electric wheelchair from the living room to the study and called James. I'll give you one day. I don't care what it takes, but you have to create an entertainment company named Euphoria. The operations and accounts will be handled independently. I'll bring Megan over tomorrow to sign the contract. After Connor ended the call, he let out a long sigh. I have to keep giving it all I've got for my future wife's sake. Since the company didn't exist, he had to create it. If there were no competitors, then he would imagine one. After hanging up the call from President, James couldn't control his urge to criticize. What kind of trick are you playing now? Are you seriously going to set up an entertainment company just for Miss Lee's sake? I don't get it. Talent X Entertainment now belongs to you, President. Plus, you're a primary shareholder for Renaissance Entertainment. If you create a new independent company now, won't it cause a ton of problems in the future? And if Euphoria Entertainment is successful in the future, then the market shares will have to be split between the three companies. The stubborn James was thoroughly amazed by his president. You really know how to have fun. If his president was a king in ancient New York, his acts of kindness and assistance upon doing everything he could for the girl he loved would have meant the fall of an empire. But what was the use of criticism? James jumped out of bed and began to make arrangements with the little time he had. The next morning, it rained. Connor woke up and went to the kitchen. Yet to his surprise, Megan was already awake and was preparing breakfast. She already gotten dressed for the day and had tied her hair into a bun. Her hand was working on a pot with a wooden spoon. Megan Johnson? exclaimed Connor. Why are you up so early? 
Megan turned, smiling when she saw Connor sitting in his wheelchair. You've already helped me quite a lot. Since I'm your personal assistant, then I should act like it and make some breakfast. Go wait for me in the dining hall. I'll be done soon. Megan turned and continued cooking the breakfast. As Connor stared at the back of Megan working hard in the kitchen, he was deeply moved. He had no idea that having someone to make him food could make him so happy. The day he had longed for had finally arrived. Megan was standing in his house, like his wife, making him breakfast. Connor didn't have to wait too long before Megan set a hearty and skillfully prepared breakfast on the table. There were meat porridges, sandwiches, a platter of fresh vegetables, beautifully shaped poached eggs, and a little plate of pickles. Megan scooped some oats and omelet into a bowl and placed it in front of Connor. She also handed him a sandwich. What do you think, Mr. Wilson? I haven't cooked for a long time, she said modestly. I'm afraid I'm quite rusty at it. When Megan was in California, she was so busy that she often had no time to cook and ended up fixing quick and easy meals. She knew that this was one of the reasons Alice had always wanted to buy a daddy, one who can cook and would never let her go hungry. Connor took a bite of a sandwich and tasted the omelet. His eyes went wide in surprise. Hmm, not bad. It's very tasty, much better than the one I make. Megan was relieved. She smiled. You are too modest, Mr. Wilson. My cooking skills are still no match for yours. You're still better. Indeed, Connor's cooking was the kind that would not forget after just a bite. You should eat too, Connor beckoned to her. Thank you. Megan sat down in the same chair she had sat in last time and dined with him. They finished their breakfast. The two are supposed to go to Euphoria Entertainment together, but Megan received a call from Olivia. Something was up, and Megan had to cancel their appointment. I am sorry, Mr. Wilson. Can we go to Euphoria Entertainment some other day? An emergency has come up. No problem. Do you need any help? No, it's all right. My friend wasn't feeling well, and I guess she's in the hospital now. I have to go and see her. Megan couldn't tell Connor the truth. The one who fell ill was Alice. Olivia had told her on the phone that Alice had just been diagnosed with acute gastroenteritis and she had been brought to the city hospital for treatment. Which hospital? Seeing that he was determined to dig deeper into the matter, Megan reluctantly answered, City Hospital. Megan grabbed her bag. Okay, I have to go now. She hurried out the door. It was raining quite heavily outside, but Megan didn't bring an umbrella. She planned to use her bag to cover her head from the rain, but she heard Connor's voice calling after her. It's raining so hard, and you don't have an umbrella. Let me send you there. I have to go to the city hospital anyway. Mr. Wilson, you don't have to send me there. I can catch a taxi when I'm outside. Megan turned and looked at him skeptically. She couldn't figure out the real reason why he wanted to go to the hospital. Was it because he really needed to, or did he just want to accompany her there? No, it's really no trouble. I'll just drop you off since we both have to go there anyways. I go to the hospital for my rehabilitation on this day every week. Connor lifted his head slightly and his dark eyes were sparkling. They were full of tenderness and sincerity. After listening to his words, Megan felt even more touched. He hadn't told her that he had to do rehabilitation on this day every week, and yet when she had told him she was free to go to Euphoria today, he decided to accompany her instead. Was he willing to skip rehabilitation to accompany her? Oh, what a sincere man. Sorry, I didn't know about your schedule. Megan was blaming herself for her ignorance. Don't be sorry. You'll have plenty of opportunities to know me in the future. Connor handed her an umbrella. The car's here. Let's go. You're in a hurry, right? Megan didn't say anything further. She took the blue checkered umbrella from Connor and got into the van. She really wanted to thank Connor for taking care of her. She would save a ton of time by riding with him. The car drove quickly and steadily. In just a few minutes, they had arrived at the general hospital. Megan thanked Connor after the car had stopped in front of the hospital. She took the umbrella and ran inside. After seeing Megan off, Connor asked his driver to drive him to the hospital's rehabilitation center. 
Connor really had intended to perform his rehabilitation at the hospital. His rehab was scheduled for every Saturday ever since he got into the accident five years ago. But in truth, until two years ago, he had been avoiding them. For the first three years after he was in the accident, he had shut himself in. He lived in pain and depression every single day. The shocking news that he would be paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of his life was devastating to a proud man like him. He had no idea how to live on and was afraid to go outside. But two years ago, when he had met a counselor named Johnson, he became more optimistic. Miss Johnson told him stories about many handicaps who faced their obstacles head on and succeeded in changing their own fate. She kept encouraging him, telling him that even if life was difficult, he'd have to face it with a smile. Johnson believed that with enough conviction, a person could find the strength to change their own fate. It was Miss Johnson who motivated him to challenge his fate and take up rehabilitation one day at a time until today. He'd successfully destroyed the devil that was lurking in his heart and body. He was no longer weak and afraid like he used to be five years ago. Even though he was still unable to walk, his heart was filled with hope and trust. Connor met up with his attending physician, Professor Matt Wild, at the rehab center. Professor Matt was in his 50s a passionate and reliable doctor. He'd been conducting Connor's rehabilitation ever since he agreed to participate in it. After greeting his doctor, Connor began to discuss the rehabilitation process with him. He sat in a special made wheelchair as Matt Wilde began to help him stretch. Bending the legs is an easy task for most people, but to people who are paralyzed, every movement comes with extreme pain and difficulty. Connor was drenched in sweat after finishing the exercises. After checking Connor's leg muscle, Matt Wilde said, Not bad, Connor. Your muscles are in better shape than when you last came in. Connor was filled with joy after hearing Matt Wilde's comment. He felt both confident and hopeful that he'd definitely get better. That's all for today, Matt Wilde said after checking his watch. Please rest a while. I don't need the rest. Could you help me do it again, please? Connor was practically begging. No one other than Connor himself understood what he was feeling. Ever since he'd finally found Megan, he wanted to get better quickly so he would be able to stand again. Only then would he be able to stand by her side and protect her. He didn't want to live as a handicapped person anymore. He just wanted to be able to stand. His determination was what pushed him to try to recover as soon as possible. He believed in the professor. He believed in himself. Someday, I'll be able to stand again. Definitely. Matt Wilde acknowledged Connor's resolution and agreed to help him go through the exercises one more time. Megan found the ward that Alice was in and entered. Both Olivia and Kevin were there to accompany the kid. Alice was lying in her bed, an IV drip hung beside her. Her little face was pale, as if there was no blood at all. Her eyes were closed, and she looked as if she could be sleeping soundly. Olivia, how's Alice? Episode 37, Hospital Scenes. Megan walked over to the hospital bed and looked down at Alice, her heart aching in her chest. She had only left her daughter for one day and she'd become sick. Megan felt like an incompetent mother. Olivia spoke quietly, not wanting to wake the child. She just fell asleep. She will recover soon. She was crying about a stomach ache when she got up in the morning, and after that she had diarrhea and she vomited. I was so scared. Then I called Kevin and we brought her to the hospital. She has acute gastroenteritis. The doctor said it's due to a bacterial infection, but it may also be that she's not accustomed to the climate here. Oh dear, said Megan. I should have come back last night. Megan understood and believed that the main cause for the illness was the climate. After all, Alice had lived in California since she was born four years ago. What could you have done even if you came back, asked Olivia, consoling her. 
Alice still has to acclimatize herself to the city, and it was inevitable that this would happen. Don't blame yourself anymore. The doctor said that she just needs to stay in the hospital for two days and she'll be all right. Thank you. I'm so glad that you and Kevin were there to help. What are you talking about? You don't have to be modest with me. Olivia patted Megan on the back of her hand, and then she remembered the doctor's advice. Oh, right. The doctor said we can give Alice a little porridge to fill her stomach after she wakes up. A nurse came in and handed Megan a medical invoice. After taking a look at it, she turned to Olivia. Can you stay here with Alice for me? I'll go pay the bill, and then I'll go home and cook some porridge for her. Why don't you give me the bill? Let me go pay the fee and cook the porridge for her instead. Olivia was worried that the task would be too exhausting for Megan. She had seen the new scars on her arm and guessed that she must have had a very tough day performing stunts the day before. No, it's okay. I'll go and I'll be back soon. Megan took the invoice and walked out quickly. She was very grateful that Olivia and Kevin had helped to take care of her child and she could not bear to let them pay the bills for her. When Megan arrived at the admissions payment counter, there were two people in front of her who had just settled their discharge procedures and were preparing to leave. Why, if it isn't President George and Miss Lee? Megan stood in front of the two, smiling. They were wearing flu mask and sunglasses like armor, but Megan could still recognize them at a glance. Upon hearing the voice of Megan, George felt his butt clenching tight. Miley looked at her and frowned. She hadn't expected to meet Megan here. Megan deliberately put on a clueless expression. What brings you two to the hospital? Was somebody sick? President George, you seem to be limping. Have you come to get your hemorrhoids removed? All thanks to her, his butt had been stabbed and wounded. If they weren't in public and if Miley wasn't there with him, he wouldn't have hesitated to hatefully tear Megan apart. Megan, don't you fool with me. George is fine, I tell you. Miley had a different status now as she was famous. She was afraid that the public would recognize her and she kept covering her face with her hands. Oh, really? I hope that you won't be offended by my words, but I do seem to remember from the news that this might not be the case. It seems that President George was so due, Miley interrupted her. Shut up. Stop talking. What? Are you worried everyone won't find out his identity? Are you happy to see him wallow in shame? He's treated you well all these years, you know. Oh, hold it right there. Don't think that I don't know anything. When we were in an official relationship back then, you guys had already hooked up. I don't care if he was the one who cheated on me or if you seduced him, said Megan. All I know was the rubbish that I threw away five years ago was picked up by you. Megan didn't hold back. The reason she'd return to New York was to punish the people who'd hurt her. The more they suffered, the happier she'd be. Miley's face darkened. Megan wasn't wrong. Miley really did feel like she picked up some scrap that Megan had thrown away. Miley looked at the guy standing beside her, who was cowering like an idiot. George had already lost the charm he had when she first met him, and now he was afraid of everything. Miley would have kicked him out if he wasn't the CEO of Renaissance Entertainment. He was still worth something. Yet Miley had never thought that he would do unlawful things behind her back, or that she'd have to clean it up for him. George was furious at Megan for exposing them. Megan, keep your mouth shut. I only started dating your sister after we broke up. We did not do anything scandalous. Don't come near us again. I'm warning you. After scolding Megan, George turned to Miley. Babe, let's go. Let's not waste any more of our time talking to insignificant people. Miley was already prepared to leave. As soon as she heard that, she ignored Megan and left with George. They kept their heads low as they left. Megan stood and waved her hand. Mr. George, I hope your butthole heals soon. 
Oh, I wish both of you a happy relationship, too. Miley climbed into the car angrily. She even ignored George when he was trying to talk to her. She was disgusted by what Megan had said and her hatred kept rising. Five years. She's like a different person. She's more vicious than ever. I must think of a way to get rid of her. Megan already knew about my relationship with George. Looks like I don't have to keep up the caring sister act anymore. You better watch your back, Megan. I'll make your life miserable if you keep getting in my way. After paying Alice's hospital bill, Megan walked towards the hospital's front door. The rain was still pouring heavily outside and many people were waiting under the A-wing. She was lucky that Connor had given her an umbrella when they came. Just as she was about to open it, she heard some gossip coming from the crowd. Hey, isn't that the award-winning actor Connor? That's him. He got the International Best Actor Award for his role in 24 Hours of Life. He was known as the Prince Charming of the showbiz and was one of the most sought-after superstars. Upon hearing the gossip, Megan's heart skipped a beat. She put down her umbrella and looked towards where the crowd was watching. Connor was sitting there, sheltering himself from the rain. A few bodyguards in black were guarding him while he sat in his wheelchair. He wore a pair of black sunglasses that covered his handsome features. In his black v-neck t-shirt, he looked elegant and sexy. Yet, it seemed his coolness was telling people to stay away from him. Did he finish his rehab? Is he trapped by the rain too? The wind was blowing hard and raindrops landed on his knees. Megan began to feel a sense of bitterness in her heart. She was worried about him. The gossip continued. His spine was injured in an accident five years ago. Now his lower limbs are paralyzed. What a pity. A superstar dropped from the sky. Did he offend someone he shouldn't have? Who knows? Fame can be dangerous. Five years ago, because of a car accident, the superstar Connor fell straight from the heavens into hell. His future shattered to dust. Ever since then, he had gradually disappeared from public view and quietly retired from the entertainment circle. No one knew the amount of despair and pain he had to go through before he was finally able to climb out of the muck to travel to the hospital for rehabilitation every week. I'm not sure whether rehabilitation works. When will he be able to get rid of the wheelchair? So what if he finally gets rid of the wheelchair? I heard that he still wouldn't be able to do it anymore. It's impossible for him to get married and have children. Does that mean that his family legacy ends with him? Not a single child. He will be childless for the rest of his life. With that beautiful face, he might as well become a woman. I agree. He was very manly whenever he played a tough guy, but he's also played a woman before, and he was more seductive than the whore of Babylon. They ridiculed and mocked him. Megan clenched her jaw as she listened to these people and felt an unspeakable heartache. Deep inside, she did not want anyone to slander Connor. It was as if she had this instinct and she felt the urge to protect the dignity of this once brilliant international superstar and boldly decided to do something about it. She snuck her bag under her shirt and shoved her way through the crowd towards Connor, shielding him with her umbrella from the light rain. Connor felt something shading him from above and looked up. He saw a pair of beautiful eyes looking down at him, bright and twinkling like stars, and a heartwarming smile beaming down. He was lost for words. He didn't expect Megan to look for him first. Megan smiled gently, her voice sweet, though deliberately loud. Husband, I'm here. Was he hearing things? What did she just call him? What? Was it husband? The exam is over. The doctor said that the baby is very healthy. Megan was putting her acting skills into good use. Whether it was a simple expression or the act of looking into his eyes, she appeared as a wife looking down at her beloved husband. Uh, was she putting on an act for him? 
The sharp-minded Connor finally understood what was going on. She could not stand those people gossiping about him and had decided to help save his reputation. Truth be told, it was not worth doing that. The gossip would have bothered him two years ago and he would have felt inferior. But now, he didn't give a damn about how people looked at him. And surely enough, the tone of the group of gossipers became different after Megan's appearance. Is Connor already married? He even had a child. Who said that he couldn't do it? When did he get married? I never heard about him marrying. It might be a secret marriage. A luxurious looking celebrity van drove over and stopped in front of them. The show must still go on. Megan handed her umbrella to a nearby bodyguard and pushed Connor's wheelchair, saying loudly, Let's go home, dear. Connor did not open his mouth the whole time. He didn't even touch the controls of his electric wheelchair and allowed her to push it for him instead. However, just in hearing those few words, his heart was already soaring. He had a wonderful thought. Was Megan starting to pay attention to him? care about him? Protect him? Episode 38, Sisters Will Take Over. Wow, being cared for by my wife sure feels good. It's so warm. The door opened and Megan pushed Connor into the van. After the wheelchair was secured in place, the van pulled away from the hospital. Megan sat on the sofa inside the van, brushing off droplets from her hair and shirt. She took out her bag that she had been covering with her shirt and smiled at Connor. Mr. Wilson, did you finish your rehab for today? Yep. Connor's dark, cool eyes appeared to convey great sentiment as he looked at Megan affectionately. With droplets still clinging to her face, Megan looked like a lotus leaf in the morning. The view in front of him was pure, fresh, and too beautiful for any person to avert their gaze. As Megan raised her head, Connor quickly turned, embarrassed. Were you worried about me just now, he asked. You don't actually have to mind what others say about me, you know. If he really minded what other people said about him, he would have died long ago from the amount of scandals he'd endured. Megan smiled and explained, It's not what you think it is. I'm just tired of hearing those good-for-nothing people bad-mouthing you. Isn't that the same as worrying about me? Connor's soft heart fluttered. Thank you. I've actually gotten used to it after all these years. When you're at your bottom, most will just laugh at you, and only a handful of people will actually come to your aid. Connor sighed. That will change now that you've met me. If anyone dares to badmouth you again, I'll punish every single one of them. Connor laughed. Her words were warmer than a fire in winter. He was deeply touched. I'll do whatever it takes to repay her kindness, even if it means sacrificing myself. Megan took a towel from the counter in the van and sat beside Connor. She helped him to wipe off the rain that was left on his hair and shoulders. Connor sat there quietly, enjoying the help from Megan. After she had finished wiping off all the water, Connor asked, How's your friend? Will she be alright? Megan thought of Alice, who was still in the hospital. She was stunned for a moment. Yes, uh, she's better now. I'm going to make some porridge for her later. Megan looked outside the window and noticed that they were driving towards Brooklyn Heights. Hey, can you ask the driver to stop here? Megan asked. I need to get out. Sure thing. Connor took out a mic and ordered the driver to turn around. Drive us to the Blueberry Community, Canal Street. The Blueberry Community was where Olivia was staying. Megan had never thought that Connor would actually let the driver drive them there. Mr. Wilson, you don't really need to drive me there. I could have taken the taxi. It's fine. It's a short drive anyways. Even though his voice was soft, there was a hint of force in it. 
As she saw the van turn towards the Blueberry community, Megan didn't argue any further. Megan had never thought that her simple act in front of the hospital would cause a massive uproar overnight. It has become the most searched topic on Weibo. One result read, Showbiz Emperor Connor married, wife thought to be an outsider. In a few pictures taken by netizens on their smartphones, it was clear as day that the one sitting in the wheelchair was Connor, yet those pictures had only caught the back of the beautiful lady pushing it. Connor had gone into hiding after the accident five years ago. He lived a simple life, avoiding each and every spotlight. But now, the moment he'd come back to the spotlight, it instantly became a huge scandal. Connor was married, and his wife was pregnant. Thousands were curious about the identity of the woman who stood behind him. The whole of Talent X Entertainment was in pandemonium in the morning. The employees were busy gossiping among themselves. Has the boss found a life partner already? Has his body and that part recovered? Not only was the company employees chat group buzzing with commotion, but the internal Wilson family chat group was also in chaos. Layla. WTF. Have you guys seen the news? Rose, what news? Layla, it's about Connor. A message was sent with photos attached. Rose, no way. When did little brother marry? Why didn't he invite us to the wedding? Ah, this can't be true. Why didn't anyone tell me anything? Damn, you guys. Why? Mary, this is just another rumor. Little brother never even mentioned that he had a girlfriend. Layla, but it's gone viral online. They're saying that little brother has a wife and a child, and the news is trending fast on the web. Is it really true? Mary, why don't we just tag little brother and ask him? Layla, oh right, at Talent X Connor, at Talent X Connor, at Talent X Connor. The three in the chat were Connor's older sisters. Mary was Connor's eldest sister. Rose was his second eldest sister. And Layla was Connor's third eldest sister. Connor was the youngest in the Wilson family and he was loved by his three sisters. His two older sisters were already married. Only the youngest sister was still single. All three sisters shared a few things in common. They were modern and independent career women and they were possessive devils who spoiled their little brother. They did not manage to bring Connor into their conversation. Instead, and because the word child had been mentioned, they managed to fish out Junior Wilson, who was often lurking in the chat group. Dawn of the Wilson family. Child? Since when did my youngest have a child? Our family now has an heir? Where? How old? Layla. OMG, Dad, we've only just heard about it ourselves. It's just a rumor, and it doesn't mean that it is necessarily true. So don't get too excited yet. Let me go find little brother and ask him what's going on. Then I'll tell you guys about it later. After that, the third sister, Layla, carried out her familial duty, barging into Connor's office. My dear little brother... Connor was busy with his work. He'd heard someone cry out, but there was no need to look up to see who it was. He knew instantly that it was his kooky sister. She must be up to no good. Layla acted nothing like a proper lady. After barreling into his office, she slammed her palms onto his desk and leaned in close. Bro, 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 bro. Is it true? Is it true? What are you talking about? Connor put down his pen and lifted his cool eyes, looking at her, puzzled. You found a partner? Where is she from? How old? Is she pretty? Layla fluttered her eyelashes at Connor, looking like a stereotypical busybody. She was three years older than he was, and they generally got along very well. Everyone in the entertainment circle knew that Layla could be a persistent, even pushy person. She used to be a famous, award-winning entertainment journalist, 
but now she had become the director of Talent X Entertainment's public relations department. Director Wilson, where did you hear the gossip from? Connor already knew what Layla had meant. He had already seen the news about his loving wife and what had happened at the hospital entrance. But he hadn't ordered his staff to deal with it. He didn't think it was a bad thing to have some rumor spread about him and Megan. It's gone viral. Don't tell me you don't know anything. Just look at the papers. Layla slammed the front page of the entertainment newspaper in front of Connor and pointed at the back of the unidentified girl. You better come clean. Who is this? Layla wasn't just there for the gossip. She was actually worried about Connor's life and future. Since the accident five years ago, the people who cared about him had to watch him suffer and fall into despair. They did offer him their assistance, but none of them had truly succeeded. Now that Connor had finally escaped his past and begun a new life, his family was happy for him. They were delighted to hear that he might have found someone he cared for and hoped that the news was real. They wanted him to have someone who would stay by his side forever. They didn't really mind who the person was or where she came from as long as she was willing to stay by his side without discrimination. She would be the benefactor of the Wilson family. What do you mean? Connor wanted to change the topic. Even though this sister of his had quit being an entertainment reporter some time ago, she was still just as interested in gossip. As the director of Talent X Entertainment's public relations department, aren't you supposed to be taking care of this problem? What are you doing gossiping around here? Hey, everyone likes some good gossip, you know. And it's not every day you get to hear some love interest gossips about yourself. I think we should have more of those. Dad, Mom, and your sisters, including me, were praying like crazy for you to enter a good relationship with someone. Connor began to wonder if the sister in front of him was adopted or something. As Connor remained quiet, Layla continued, Try to think harder. Did you have a one-night stand with anyone before? What are you implying? Well, Maybe you have an illegitimate child somewhere that we don't know of. That would mean that the Wilson family will finally have an heir. Mom and Dad would love to see that. Layla rubbed her hand, her eyes wide open. But seriously, was there ever any girl that you were close to? Nope. You know I have heterophobia. But the fact was that he used to be quite close with Lily at some time. Now, the only girl that was really close to him was Megan. Yet Connor sincerely believed that now wasn't the right time to introduce Megan into the picture. Their relationship hadn't even truly begun yet. If Megan was pressured by his family, she could just get intimidated and leave. Don't you dare try to use that. Your heterophobia excuse might have convinced Mum, Dad, and the other more gullible sisters, but definitely not me. Do you really think I'm that stupid? Layla raised her eyebrows. She had already heard from the Abe Hannibal that her brother made up the heterophobia issue to prevent the family from introducing different him to so many different women. Connor sighed and looked at his sister. I'm telling you the truth. I don't even know who the girl in the picture is. You used to be an entertainment reporter yourself. Can't you see that this girl was just trying to use the situation to gain fame? Layla studied the picture in the paper again. Now that he mentions it, it really does seem that way. Since Connor had denied the scandal himself, Layla stopped pressuring her brother and sighed. Why does it have to be fake news? If you'd found true love, Mom, Dad, and our sisters might stop pressuring me to find someone for myself. Layla, are you really worried about my future, or are you just trying to stop Mom and Dad urging you to get married? The smart Connor had caught on quickly. The third sister of his was a celibatarian. Even if she was already in her 30s, she had yet to find a partner. Though she didn't pay much attention to it, her families were anxious about it. After having her true intentions exposed, Layla laughed awkwardly. She took Connor's hand. Episode 
episode 39, we have visitors. Oh, my dear brother, how sharp-minded you are. You know that I don't want to get married. So whether it's for me, for you, or for the Wilson family, it's still better that you're the one who wants to find a life partner. That way, Mom and Dad won't be so anxious. Connor smiled helplessly. I do want to find a life partner, but who would want a cripple like me? Connor? Layla's tone had changed and she was getting a little angry. How many times have I told you not to say those self-deprecating words? Layla realized that she'd gone over the top and quickly softened her voice. Brother, what did you just say? You want to find a partner? You're worried that people won't even glance at you? You have nothing to worry about. My dear brother is the best man in the world. It will be a great blessing for any woman who finds you. And even though you're not in good shape now, she continued, I still believe in you. I'm sure one day you will overcome your obstacles. Work hard, brother. Thank you. Connor returned a smile. He knew that even though he'd become a cripple, his family had never given up on him. They would always stand behind him, encourage him, and support him. Okay then, I'll let you finish your work. See you. Although she did not manage to pry any valuable information from her brother's mouth, Layla did not continue to press him. She comforted her brother and let him continue his work, leaving his office. After all, Layla was formerly an award-winning entertainment journalist. She could tell whether the rumors in the entertainment circle were intentionally fabricated. Her Layla were sharp and discerning, and she could usually tell whether a news report was fake or real. Though she believed her brother's words, she still had a nagging suspicion. Layla walked into the elevator and inside she saw James who had just returned from some errands. Layla's eyes lit up and she moved over to block James from exiting. James could not get out. He looked up and saw the person who had blocked him was his boss's third eldest sister. He quickly greeted her. Director Wilson. Layla smiled and stepped closer and closer to him, backing him into the wall. He couldn't escape. Director Wilson, what? What do you want? James asked nervously. Layla could be a boorish woman when it came to getting what she wanted. She stretched out an arm and slapped it onto the wall beside James's neck. James, she began, have you been responsible for managing the president's affairs lately? Uh-huh, said James timidly as he stood frozen in Miss Wilson's grip, which could be used in seduction, but in this moment was being used as a means to entrap. He had always heard that Layla was a tough woman and today he was seeing it up close. So it is true. Have you noticed him behaving strangely lately? I mean, is there someone he fancies? Has he been seeing anyone? Layla looked straight into James's eyes. Behaving strangely? Of course. Since the appearance of Miss Johnson, the president had changed. He would no longer lose his temper as easily, nor would he slip into depressive moods. He was even more engaged with his work now. But now that Layla was asking, he could not tell her. He knew the affairs of his president. For five years, his president had been in love with Miss Johnson, and for five years, he had been waiting for her. However, James could not disclose this matter to anyone, as his president had ordered him not to. The severe lack of space between them made James very nervous and embarrassed. He was starting to sweat. He pretended to be as calm as he answered. No, the president had been focusing on his work. Really? Yes. Layla was about to continue the interrogation, but the elevator doors opened. Mr. Goldman from the Human Resources Department stepped in and saw. Obviously shocked at what he saw, he retracted his foot from the elevator and apologized. Oh, sorry, sorry, carry on. James was lost for words. Mr. Goldman, no, don't go. 
it's really not what you think. Layla noticed that she was getting too close to James and quickly drew back her arm. She took a few steps back. After Layla left, James let out a sigh of relief. He began to worry how long they'd be able to keep on the relationship between the president and Megan a secret. Megan had no idea about the scandal that was forming outside. She had been staying by Alice's side for the past few days. Alice's vomiting had stopped and she was in better shape than the day before. The doctor told them that she would be ready for discharge after one more day in the hospital. The little cutie sat on the bed, blinking her big, sleepy eyes. She sat quietly as Megan fed her porridge, one spoonful after another. After she finished a bowl of porridge, Alice licked her lips and stared at the empty container. Mom, is there any more porridge left? She rubbed her belly. Megan set the bowl on a table and helped Alice wipe her mouth with the paper towel. The doctor said you're still recovering and that your stomach is still weak. You shouldn't eat any more right now. I'll let you eat more once you're out of the hospital, okay? Fine, I'll listen to mom and the doctors, said Alice, slightly disappointed. Good girl, Megan patted Alice on the head. Alice suddenly remembered something and grabbed Megan's hand. Mom, didn't you say that you'd bring me to great grandpa's house today? What should we do since I'm in the hospital now? Will he be worried if we don't show up? He won't. Megan took her daughter's hand. I've already told him what happened. He said he will come visit you in the hospital. Really? What does he look like? Does he have white hair and a long beard? Does he have a crooked back? Alice tilted her head and began to wonder what her great-grandfather looked like. She asked if he would be like all those old men that she had seen in storybooks. As she thought about this, the door opened and two people came in. Grandpa, Uncle Gary, you two came. Megan stood when she saw that it was her maternal grandfather Richard and the Johnson's family butler, Uncle Gary. Megan! Richard smiled gently as he walked into the room. The old man had white hair and a long beard. He was already 71, but he was still healthy and had no vision or hearing problems. He walked as swift as the wind and kept his back up straight. The Johnson family has been in medicine for generations. They opened up a clinic named Johnson Medicine Hall and as one of the oldest doctors there, Richard was well known around the world. He had always taken care of his body and remained free from severe and minor sickness. Grandpa, didn't I tell you not to come? asked Megan. I'll take the kid to come meet you when she's fully healed. She took a basket of fruit from Uncle Gary. But I was so eager to see my great-granddaughter. When Richard had heard that his granddaughter was coming back and that she'd be bringing a four-year-old daughter, he wanted to meet them as soon as possible. They were supposed to meet that day, but when Alice had suddenly come down with sickness, he decided to go out of his way to come and meet them. Richard stood beside the bed and looked at the little thing lying in it. The little girl's skin was slightly pinked, her face full of energy, her body well fed. One sight and he knew the little girl was smart and would bring them happiness in the future. As soon as Richard laid his eyes on Alice, he instantly fell in love with her. Alice stared at the old man in front of her with starry eyes. She'd already known that he was her great-grandfather and didn't wait for him to start speaking. I know who you are, Alice said with her cute little voice. Oh, you know who I am? Richard asked with a surprised smile. You are Mommy's grandpa, my great-grandpa, she laughed. Grandpa really does have a beard, just like how Alice imagined. This is great. Alice has a great-grandpa who looks like Santa Claus. Alice clapped her little hands excitedly. Grandpa, can baby touch your beard? Okay. Richard did not expect his great-granddaughter to be so clever. She was more talkative than Megan was as a child. He sat down by Alice's bed and leaned over to let the little girl touch his beard. As Alice reached out to touch it, Richard eagerly asked, How is it? What does my beard feel like? Alice smiled, two lovely little dimples peeking out on her cheeks. Grandpa's beard feels like a big tigger's beard. 
Richard was puzzled, uncertain of what the word Tigger meant. Grandfather, said Megan, she means that your beard is like a big tiger's whiskers. Richard laughed out loud in hearing Megan's explanation. He turned to his great-granddaughter again. Oh, have you touched a big tiger's beard before? Of course. Last year, Mom gave me a very big tiger as a birthday present, and it has a long beard. It's a pity that Baby couldn't bring it back. Thinking about her big tiger, Alice felt a little sad and pouted her lips. Alice was born in the year of the tiger. Last year, on her birthday, Megan had bought her an oversized plush tiger. Alice loved it and would put the big tiger beside her bed every night so it could protect her mommy. When they were preparing to return from California, Alice wanted to bring the tiger back with her, but it was too big, so she couldn't. She cried when they had to leave it behind. Since you can't touch the big tiger's beard anymore, then I'll let you touch mine, okay? Richard's beard was precious to him, and he normally wouldn't let anyone touch it. But now that he'd set a precedent for Alice, he made an exception. It showed that the old man really liked her. Yay, okay. You're too kind, great-grandpa. Alice is so blessed to have such a good great-grandpa like you. It must be my reward for saving the planet in my previous life. Alice smiled. <laughs> Alice was still a young child, but she talked like an adult. She was so amusing. The three adults in the ward laughed delightfully at her antics. Richard spent a few hours at the hospital. He had a long conversation with Megan and played with Alice for a while before leaving with Uncle Gary. Before he left, Richard told them that they would get a driver to come pick up Alice on Tuesday morning. On the third day of Alice's hospitalization, she was looking more spirited and could eat normally. The doctor gave her one last examination, then told Megan that she could go ahead and settle the discharge procedure. Olivia and Kevin came to the hospital to pick up Alice. When no one was looking, Olivia pulled Megan aside, a newspaper in hand. Megan? What's going on? What? Megan took the newspaper from Olivia. When she read it, she realized that when she'd stood up for Connor at the hospital entrance, it had quickly become a scandal. The news reported that Connor had married secretly and that he had accompanied his wife to the hospital for a pregnancy exam. There, in the photo on the page, was Megan, facing away from the camera. Episode 40, New House Is it just me or does the girl in the picture look like you? asked Olivia. Isn't that the shirt you were wearing the day before yesterday? Are you serious? That doesn't look like me. Although, the shirt is almost the same. I knew I should have thrown that shirt away. It's probably everywhere. Olivia believed Megan. Maybe it really was just the same shirt and Megan wouldn't want it to appear that she had anything to do with Connor. Connor was on good terms with Miley and George, so Megan should definitely hate him. The next day, Olivia and Kevin stayed with Alice while Megan went to take care of Alice's discharge procedure. After everything was settled, the three of them took Alice out of the hospital. When Olivia was about to leave, she hugged Alice and said, Little Cherry, have a fun time at your great-grandpa's place. When you come back, we'll continue live-streaming together. Alice threw her arms around Olivia's neck, hugging her and kissing her face. Of course, Aunt Olivia. You take care of yourself, too. Eat well and sleep well. Olivia was melted by the cuteness of Alice. She was not only adorable, but caring, too. Even after Alice had left the taxi, Olivia kept staring at it. Kevin pulled her close. Olivia, stop staring. They've already left. Olivia looked at Kevin. Kevin, I want a girl like Alice. Let's make a baby of our own. Kevin was stunned, but also touched by what she had just said. He pulled her close as they walked out. 
Of course. Let's go. Let's go back and make a baby. Even though they had been dating for seven years, they never once had sex. This was because Olivia wanted to wait until marriage and Kevin respected her beliefs. Now that he'd heard that his girlfriend wanted to make babies, he almost fainted from happiness. The mansion where Megan's grandfather lived was called Johnson Villa. It had been a long time since the Johnson family was so noisy. Richard had ordered the servants to clean the whole house and had bought a lot of supplies and preparation. He'd even prepared rooms for Megan and Alice as he expected them to be staying for quite a while. Megan led Alice into her grandfather's house. The mansion was just as she remembered it, spotless. The mansion's garden was filled with all sorts of herbs, giving the place a feeling of lushness and vibrancy. The place had a unique, almost antique aroma brought on by the herbs that perfumed the garden. The butler, Uncle Gary, emerged and greeted him. He took them to the master room where Richard was waiting. We're here, Grandpa, said Megan. Unlike other kids who would be nervous when they arrived at a new place, Alice kept looking left and right as they made their way to the main room. As they entered the room, she saw her great-grandfather and ran up and hugged him. Great-grandpa, I've missed you. I missed you too, little one. Richard picked her up. My little great-granddaughter is like a strong tiger now. Look at my arms, great-grandpa. They're strong, aren't they? Alice stretched out her arm for Richard to check. Richard pinched her arm and commended her. It sure is. A row of white teeth appeared as Alice smiled at her great-grandfather's praise. Richard led her through the house. Come, little one, guess what I prepared for you. Alice pondered and pondered. She could not guess what her great-grandpa had gotten for her. Baby can't guess. Baby is not a tapeworm who lives in great-grandpa's belly. Baby wouldn't know what is in great-grandpa's head. <laughs> what a delightful little child. Richard had no words to describe his mood, but as long as there was Cherry Baby, there wouldn't be any more dull days. Next, Richard took them to see their room. He had arranged for both mother and daughter to stay in one room, which was specially decorated and quite cozy. When Alice entered the room, she was pleasantly surprised to find an oversized tiger plush on her bed. It was about the same size as the one Megan had bought for her last year. Wow, 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 it's a big tigger. Alice jumped up and down on her little feet excitedly. Great Grandpa, it's the big ticker, the present you bought for baby? Yes, it's for my lovely little great granddaughter. Richard smiled at her. Wow, Great Grandpa, you are too kind. Long live Great Grandpa. Alice took Richard's arm and pulled him towards her. When he bent down, she planted a grateful kiss onto his cheek. Great. I can now be friends with the big tigger again. After kissing her great-grandfather, Alice released his hand and happily toddled off to hug the tiger plush. The tiger was really big, taller than Megan. Alice's petite body could only cling to it, hugging and rolling with it on the ground. Megan and her grandfather saw how happy Alice was, and they felt very happy themselves. Richard turned to her and said, Megan, from now on, you will live here in my house. This will be Alice's and your home. Just tell me if you need anything else, and I'll arrange the servants to prepare it for you. Thank you, Grandfather. Megan gave Richard a thankful hug. But I may not be able to live here often in the future, as I'm going to start filming soon. I won't have time to come back once I get busy, and I'll most likely live somewhere else. Megan was going to move in next door to Connor's house, and it would be impossible for her to stay at the Johnson residence. She wanted to explain this clearly in advance. Will you be all right if you live elsewhere? What about the child? After you've started filming, how are you going to take care of her? 
I'll see how it goes for a while and wait until September when school starts. Then I'll find a kindergarten for Alice. When the time comes, Alice will be at school during the day and I'll only need to take her to school in the morning and pick her up in the evening. However, this was only her plan. If that accident hadn't happened back then when they were in New York, then Alice wouldn't be afraid of going to school. All right, said Richard. Just leave the child to me and you can go film with some peace of mind. My bones are still tough and I have more than enough energy to take care of her. I will be very relieved with Alice in your care. I won't have to worry anymore whenever I go out filming, no matter how far away. Megan was very grateful to her grandfather for the support and care he provided for so many years. When her mother had died, her grandfather had been very heartbroken to have lost his only beloved daughter, and it was Megan who had accompanied him through those difficult times. Therefore, the bond between Megan and her grandfather was strong, much stronger than the bond she had with the Lee family. Richard took Alice to the garden to play. Megan went into her mother's former bedroom to see if she could find some valuable clues. The room was very clean and kept the same way as it had been before. Richard would regularly let the servants clean the room and everything was well maintained. Megan's eyes lingered over every item in the room, familiar memories emerging from the depths of her mind. The image of Megan's mother as she looked when she lived at the mansion was clearly etched into Megan's mind. Her mother had stayed there before she died, alone and helpless. The darkness and scandals from the entertainment industry had swallowed her like a raging beast. She could have been successful in her music career, but to help Michael achieve his dream of being a movie director, she gave up on her dreams and entered showbiz. She worked hard to earn money, helping to form Michael's directing career, introducing him to many actors and producers. And yet, how did Michael repay her? If Christine refused to give him money, he would beat her. If Christine was accused of a scandal with another man, Michael would beat her. Just when Michael achieved a little success, he went behind her and had an affair with Clara. They even had a kid together. He would turn to any means necessary to get rid of Christine. When Megan was still little, she often watched her mother hide in a corner, hugging her legs and crying alone, every night until she died. Her mother was diagnosed with depression and lived out her remaining days nearly paralyzed by alcoholism. In the end, death found its way to her doorstep. Megan closed her eyes and tears started to fall. During her short life, Christine was only truly happy when she was pursuing her music career. Tragedy began after she met Michael. Megan wanted to know how her mother's love life was before she was married to Michael. Who was the one who gave her the precious sun grass brooch? With these questions in mind, Megan opened her mother's closet. But she only found old clothes, nothing fancy. She opened the crate that was filled with books and music scores, but something was lying at the bottom of the container. A photo frame. The frame was bizarre. Only a pair of ruby-made cufflinks could be found in the middle of it. Why are there cufflinks here? Megan opened the frame from the back. She took it apart and found something stuck in the center of it. It was an ultrasound scan of an unborn infant, a type B image. When Megan was pregnant with Alice, she had taken type B ultrasound scans, so she knew what the picture was. She looked at the photo and realized it was taken a long time ago, 23 years ago to be exact, a few months before Megan was born. Then, could it be that the baby in the picture is me? She turned to the back and noticed a bit of text that was fading. F. You're the best I've ever met. F seems like a code name to Megan. But why would Mom write such a sentence behind this ultrasound? Who is F? Was he a guy that Mom once loved? 